Your Royal Highness, Nobel Prize laureates, friends of science. It's my great honor to welcome you all to our planet, the Nobel Prize academic science session of today. We are coming to you live from Stockholm. My name is Caroline Johansson. I'm a strategic advisor at Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University, and I have the pleasure of being your host throughout the session today and the session tomorrow, where we will enter our future. Normally, we would have met in person. However, we are actually taking advantage of the current circumstances by welcoming an even wider set of people to join us digitally. Before taking off, I'd just like to remind you that this session will be recorded and can be found at the Nobel Prize Summit website in a couple of days. And on that same site, you will also find the white paper, Our Future in the Anthropocene Biosphere, which is the core of both sessions. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how interconnected our globalized world is. In the same way, people and nature are intertwined and embedded within the biosphere. Human behavior is the major force in shaping the future of the planet. And it has done so in a scale and pace that has sent shock waves throughout the biosphere. We have gathered world class speakers that will enlighten us and inspire us on how to make the transformative change towards a sustainable future. And that is exactly what we are going to talk about during these two sessions. It is clearly an understatement to say that science is important, but you will also need the skill to explain the truly complicated science in order to be able to influence society. Our first speaker is a professor whom I have admired since the very first time I met him many years ago for exactly that reason. He is here to set the scene. I am proud to present to you the Secretary General at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Nobel Foundation. Professor Göran K. Hansson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, Nobel laureates, friends and colleagues. It's really a privilege also for me to welcome you all to the science sessions of this Nobel Prize Summit entitled Our Planet, Our Future. But is there a future? We live at a critical time in the history of our planet, and we are uncomfortably close to a tipping point. The changes we face are largely man-made, and therefore humanity can and must act to improve the situation. This is a daunting task, and we need to mobilize all sectors and all strata of society in that work. But it's not an impossible task. It can be done. As an example of how it can be done, look at how the challenge with the ozone layer was handled 35 years ago. Scientists discovered that the ozone hole was expanding. They elucidated the chemistry behind it, and they pointed out ways to protect the ozone layer in the atmosphere. Opinion leaders, decision makers and the general public all over the world uh, were mobilized. And we got the Montreal Protocol and forceful measures were taken that resulted in a protection of the ozone layer. Paul Crutzen, who 
passed away earlier this year, was one of the key scientists uh, in that work. He shared the 1995 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discoveries regarding the chemistry of the atmosphere. Crutzen also pointed out that humans have a decisive influence over the atmosphere today. And he proposed that we live in a new geological era, the Anthropocene. Humankind now has to assume responsibility for the conditions in the Anthropocene, in the era that we have created. And in order to change it for the better, knowledge is our best weapon. The Nobel Prize awards discoveries that change the world for the benefit of humankind. Therefore, the Nobel Foundation is proud to co-organize this summit together with the US National Academies, the Potsdam Institute, the Stockholm Resilience Center, and the Bayer Institute of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. We all look forward to an exciting and important session that should be followed by action. Thank you. Professor Hansson, thank you as always. When it comes to major transformations, like moving towards a more resilient planet, we need people who dare to lead the way and to show that there are other solutions. We need people who want to talk about the really tough challenges. We need people who are role models. We are now going to listen to a person who has spent her whole life learning and talking about nature, climate, the, the oceans, ecosystems, and many, many other related areas. It was no surprise that she was appointed as an advocate for the UN Sustainable Development Goals a couple of years ago. She is here to give us the opening remarks. It's my great honor to present to you Her Royal Highness, Crown Princess Victoria of Sweden. The floor is yours. One month ago, a 200,000 ton ship became stranded in the Suez Canal, one of the world's biggest and busiest trade routes was suddenly blocked, leaving hundreds of ships waiting to pass through. Shortly after, an image appeared in news and social media all over the world. I'm guessing that most of you have seen it. A seemingly small yellow excavator hunkered in the shadow of this enormous ship, patiently, patiently digging in the sand. Five days after, after the digging and tugging, the ship was freed, but not until the moon came to the rescue in the form of a rising tide. That image has stayed with me ever since. Despite all our human efforts, in the end, the nature, we depend on the nature to help us. Ladies and gentlemen, through the years, I've had the great privilege of meeting a number of Nobel laureates, some of whom I believe are with us right now. For me and my family, attending the Nobel Prize ceremonies and the meetings, meetings with the laureates is a traditional high point of each year, a cherished light in the Swedish December dark. The Nobel Prize instituted by the Swedish industrialist Alfred Nobel at the turn of the 20th century is widely considered the world's most prestigious award, celebrating those who is, in the words of the uh, great donor, uh, who has, in the, in the words of the great donor, conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. 
During 120 years, many groundbreaking discoveries and achievements have been awarded. And still, the Nobel Prize is so much more than an award. It is an inspiration and a reminder to all of us of the potential of the human capacity, of the transformative power of science and art, and the opportunity of a better future for all. Esteemed laureates, ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, we will hear Professor Karl Folke present the key messages of this meeting's white paper. I have gotten to know the Professor Folke personally via the initiative CBOS, Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship. And over the years, we have had many opportunities to discuss the fascinating dynamic interplay between humankind and na the nature that we depend on. As the white paper points out, we are now at the moment in time where humanity has become the dominant force of change on planet Earth, causing increasing turbulence in our biosphere. That can be a frightening thought. However, we can also choose to see it from the opposite angle. Humankind is at the steering wheel of our planet. We have science, we have technology, we have an interconnected global economy. And that means we do have a choice. Esteemed laureates, ladies and gentlemen, we can stay on the current course with devastating consequences for the planet that we depend on. Or we can choose now to take a safer, more resilient path to turn the ship around before it's too late. The choice is ours, and this is our window of opportunity. Thank you. Your Royal Highness, thank you as always for sharing your insights and encouraging words. With these two extraordinary opening remarks, it certainly feels like we are ready to dive into the details. It is said that you can't start a fire without a spark. As so many times before, that very spark is a professor with many ideas and with the ability to bring them to life. Without him, there would probably not have been a Stockholm Resilience Center. The idea of CBOS, an initiative leading a sustainability transformation of the seafood industry, would not have been brought up. There would not have been a white paper about the biosphere, and there would definitely not have been a session today. He often says that transformation is good, but that requires transformers. He is indeed a transformer. He has inspired thousands of students within sustainability science. He is a shaper of minds. He is Professor Karl Folke, member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the US National Academy of Sciences. Professor Folke, before you start, what is your driving force and why are we here? That's a really good question actually and I think that the driving force is really uh, to try to understand what is really going on in the world and, and from the scientific perspective and to be able to use uh, the best of science to help guide as best as we can society into better futures. And I guess we're here to to look at the baselines of what science says today, actually, on, on the big challenges on, of, of the planet. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what I will try to do in a few minutes now. And it will be followed by three other presentations, uh, recent insights and synthesis of, of uh, the challenges. 
Your Royal Highness, very nice to have you here. Thanks a lot for, for uh, joining us on this event. This is a thin layer, a very unusual place in this immense uh, universe. It is the biosphere, actually. Not very big, not much more than 20, 25 kilometers. Uh, that's where life is. Uh, the only life we know exists as a complex uh, as it is on this planet. And, and we are part of it, actually. It's not an environment outside our societies or our economies. We are living in it. We, are, we have emerged within it. We have evolved with it. And we are actually embedded in it. We are embedded in this thin layer. Uh, to look at the world from that perspective is very different from what we have done in the last two, three generations, where we have largely looked at the resilience of this biosphere as something that, yes, will have always be there. But as we already heard now in the introduction, and as many of you who are part of this session uh, know, we are have now entered into the Anthropocene biosphere, uh, a planet shaped by us as humans. Uh, and not just shaped a little bit, but actually at the global level. The climate issue is, of course, one, one uh, reflection of that. So what we are doing today is basically shaping evolution of all living organisms and we are shaping the landscapes the ocean and basically every corner on, of this this earth uh, and that's fine if, if we're doing that but we also have to realize what it means to be doing that uh, we did a background piece trying to synthesize uh, the state of knowledge in science around our future on this little round ball uh, and and it's, uh, um, it, it has become the white paper of the Nobel Prize Summit. This is a picture from that paper uh, ref reflecting beautiful art and uh, piece of, of the puma. And, and uh, here, is, here is the, the content of the paper, actually. And I just, I just talked about the first part, the biodiversity part, uh, and the biosphere part and the Anthropocene. Uh, the next uh, section, which follows the themes of, of uh, the no uh, Nobel Prize Summit, is about climate change and biodiversity loss. And you could argue that these two are not issues in their own right, but they are symptoms of this enormous increase of our actions on Earth, actually. And and uh, just some important points around that. You you may be aware that we have, during the last 11,000 years, lived in a very favorable uh, climate called the Holocene era, and that's where the civilizations have emerged. Basically, we we now more or less know that we are uh, have left the Holocene era and are moving into more dynamic uh, space. And you may also know that that the Earth has not been warmer than about two degrees in the last three million years. Uh, and we have been around as a species to count with in, for about 250,000 years. So if we move beyond the two degrees warming of the planet, then we are really, really into something quite different from, from we have seen what we have seen and ever experienced before. So already now at 1.2 degrees warming, we, we see changes in, in the way the, the planet operates. We've seen the, the uh, fires and uh, droughts and uh, and heavy rainfalls, and these now interact with with our economic and social activities, and and we refer to that as the intertwined system of people and nature. Actually, that it it, it is wrong nowadays to treat uh, our societies as one thing and and the environment as another. It's completely interwoven and intertwined in today's world. Another important dimension that uh, this paper writes about in depth is the homogenization of, of the planet. And, and uh, homo uh, homogenization or simplification of the landscapes has caused a lot of reduction in our biological diversity on Earth. And, and uh, biological diversity and, uh, is very important for, for buffering shocks and disturbances. So. At the same time as we're heating up the planet, we have also lost a lot of the capacity of the planet to, 
to buffer uh, buffer climate change through the simplification. And, and uh, another section of the paper really looks at the the challenge of potential tipping points or tipping elements. And there was a whole a whole um, webinar before the summit uh, dealing with that. Uh, basically, the, to, to uh, having the risk of areas of Earth today that are critical sinks for greenhouse gases may rapidly become sources for it, and we may, may heat up the planet very fast. So these are not very uh, encouraging or exciting things, but they are sort of reported as the state of the, the understanding uh, currently in science. Another dimension tightly coupled to this is the inequality and, and global sustainability issue. And, and of course, there are very important links on, of inequality that we know about, for example, uh, that both slow environmental change and rapid environmental change basically hit the poorer and, and marginalized much more than, than other societies that have, have a stronger capacity to deal with it both adaptively and economically. But what is not as clear is the other way around, how inequality actually shapes th the biosphere. And there's a lot of work now taking place to try to look at the role of inequality and what it means in terms of, in terms of different drivers on Earth. For example, for example, we have things like uh, fairness, aspirations, market and wealth concentration. These type of issues, what, what, uh, how do they play out in relation to the biosphere? And obviously, we also know that to really be able to collaborate, we need trust and social capital and the collective action. And the inequality is really a counter force uh, on, on, that, on that space. To move to the other, the, the last two parts of the paper is, uh, is about social transformations and technological change, basically, and biosphere stewardship. And of course, the technological change is an amazing and important issue. Uh, and uh, we are uh, right now in a, a big revolution uh, of, of a new technological change from synthetic biology, biotechnology to, to AI, machine learning, the whole information technology that makes this meeting possible, and so on and so forth. But, but the connection with those rapid emergencies of technologies to global sustainability has not been done very, very much yet, actually. And I think there's an enormous potential here to redirect or um, incentivize this technological revolution so it becomes a positive force for a sustainable future on Earth. Another dimension here is social uh, innovation. Uh, there has been a lot of work on uh, what people call social technical uh, transitions or social ecological system transformations and also social innovation as such. Really discovering uh, how we can shift from, from one uh, way of doing things into a very different way of doing things. Uh, very, very robust and interesting findings that are reported a lot in, in this paper as well. And also recent research on social tipping points and social, social tipping elements and these type of things. And, and finally, uh, which, we, which we think is very inspiring, is the emergence of new narratives for the future, new stories of, of how we can really develop uh, in, in, in synergy with the planet we're living on. And that, and that moves us to, to the last part, uh, really about transformation and biosphere stewardship. And it has become quite clear that, that uh, if we think that climate issues or uh, the biosphere are, are sort of marginal issues that we can easily fix with a quick solution, or, or if we think that we can only adapt to these type of changes uh, the, the likelihood for a prosperous future is not, is not uh, that super high, actually. So there's more and more consensus that we really need to shift development pathways of society, uh, which we call transformation. And uh, in that transformation also improve our capacity to be stewards of our own future uh, of the planet. And so biosphere stewardship is not only stewardship of, of the global commons, like the oceans, forests, and, and uh, the landscapes, it's also how we organize society in relation to the planet, how we find ways to collect, collect 
uh, have collective action and really move forward. And, and therefore we are pushing and introducing the concept of revitalizing biosphere resilience to strengthen the capacity of this little round ball and the thin layer that we're living in to deal with these shocks and, and to deal with climate change so we can prosper and live nicely, hopefully in long time in the, in the future and for future generations. We will end this session today with uh, a presentation of a, uh, an urgent call for action by Professor Brian Smith and Professor Johan Rockström. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will have a chance to reflect on those and there are some people who have also the opportunity to comment and send questions uh, on, on that call for action. Thank you very much. Professor Folke, thank you as always. We are now going to listen to three speakers who will, from their different perspectives, give us their views on life within the biosphere. At the end of last year, the National Academy of Sciences convened a workshop to review the cutting-edge research on sustainable development. The aim was partly to provide scientific input to this Nobel Prize summit. To give us a summary and the conclusions from that workshop, I am delighted to present Professor Pamela Matson, member of the National Academy of Sciences. Coming to us live from Hawaii, good morning, Professor Matson. The screen is yours. Well, thank you so much and good day to all of you. Um, I am so pleased to be here to be able to share some of the research-based findings of a recent workshop of the National Academies. Um, and and I, I co-chaired this workshop with Bill Clark at, Stan at Harvard, but also a steering committee of seven Academy members. And I note here that they included both Carl Foki and Partha Dasgupta, who are speaking in this session. The purpose of the workshop was to update the scientific community on uh, sustainability science. Uh, let's see if I can move that forward. Could I advance the so slides, please? Seems to not be working here. Could I have the next slide, please? Hmm. Um, if, uh, if someone there can advance the slides, that'd be great. I'm having a hard time. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. The workshop goal um, was to update the scientific community on progress in sustainability science over the past decade or two. And we decided to focus on some cross-cutting themes that we agreed would be essential to efforts towards sustainability. And we wanted to share that not just with other scientists, scientists, but with decision makers. And that's very happy to be at this summit and we'll look for other opportunities as well. The six cross-cutting themes uh, or foci can be thought of as capacities um, that are necessary for pursuing sustainability, no matter which issue one is working on, you know, climate change or the energy transition, poverty alleviation, food security, or other challenges. And I'm gonna go through these one by one and highlight at least some of the um, take home messages from each. But before I do that, I want to take a moment to, um, to second the message that Carl Foki sent to all of us. And that is that these decisions for sustainability are playing out in complex intertwined nature society systems. And if we forget that, we are not gonna make very much progress. Social, technological, and natural elements of that complex system interact with each other. And interventions in one have unintended sometimes consequences in others. So embrace that complexity. And the good news is that we have frameworks for doing that. We're training our up and coming students to learn to be systems thinkers. And I think all of us need to be able to do that. But on to these, the, the take home messages, the six capacities that we talked about at our meeting. First is the capacity for adapting to shocks and uncertainties. You know, research has shown that um, it, we're often uh, trying to respond to multiple and interacting stresses, not just economic, but also social, political, cultural, and biophysical. 
And um, we need to draw on all of those resources in order to, to respond effectively. Ignoring that reality or assuming that parts of the system are, are static and other parts are changing um, will definitely limit the effectiveness of our actions to respond. And likewise, building up missing assets to help us build our capacity um, can help. The complexity of the situations that we're in also means that sometimes adapting in the short run successfully may be maladaptive in the long run. And what works in one place may not work in another place. And um, you know what adaptations at one scale may impede adaptations at other spatial scales. One of our participants at the meeting said that adaptive capacity includes the ability to make and remake relationships across biophysical and social parts of the system over time. And I think we are building the kinds of tools and approaches that allow that to happen. The second of the areas, the capacity for transforming systems um, is likewise really important. You know, while we can do adaptation and must do adaptation, I think it's quite likely that structural transformations will be needed in order for us to meet our basic needs going forward. We're beginning to have some basic understanding of what is needed to break down drivers of lock-in and the social, economic, and political drivers of that lock-in that we are trying to overcome. The importance of, of bottom-up experimentation as well as top-down policy interventions that help destabilize established regimes that we're trying to change and diffuse innovations. There's no doubt a lot more can be learned here, but we, but the, you know, the good news is we do have frameworks that help various actors, whether they're NGOs or, or governments or firms, understand the roles that they can play during the transformative um, process. Um, and one really important finding of the workshop is that transformative change rests on the engagement of all kinds of participants, traditional and non-traditional. And, and we need to work together to imagine and create alternative visions. And the exciting thing is, to, is that there are processes now underway for communities and groups of people to do that. The next um, area of uh, capacities for measuring progress. This is a hot topic and a challenging topic for scientists of all times and has been for decades. And it's clear that it is essential here. Um, our survey of the science um, recognized that there's considerable progress. We have some new tools, including remotely sensed tools and approaches, data sources for measuring and um, sharing information about various elements of this complex system, you know, the nat natural capital, planetary systems, human health, consumption, production, and so forth at a variety of scales. And um, at the same time, our panelists recognized that we, we are still far from having um, complete and practical measures of the whole system and of things that can tell us about sustainability into the future rather than just about the current state of nature society systems. One set of metrics that does provide that more complete and, uh, picture is the inclusive wealth index. And I think it's the most important contribution of science to the pursuit of sustainability over the last several decades. And we have our colleague, Partha Descupta and, and many others to thank for this. These metrics are now regularly tabulated and published by the UN and the World Bank and other organizations. And they focus on not just economics, but on the biophysical and manufactured and social and human assets of these systems. Um, and they're mostly applied at national scales, but some at regional scales now. And I think expanding these, uh, these approaches to the global scale on one hand and to local scales and corporate scales on the other is a top priority for sustainability science going forward. Um, capacity for governing uh, is, is something that is, um, is, is a changing rapidly. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, people and organizations have to anticipate and respond, not to, just to a single problem um, in a single place at a single time with a single community, but rather to multiple changes and stresses all happening at once. And the research um, suggests that 20th century governance systems don't do this well, and that we can no longer just focus on individual issues, but we need to engage different people, different communities, 
with different visions and values and capacities in decision making together. So multiple new forms of cross-scale, collaborative, polycentric governance are now being tried around the world and tested and evaluated scientifically. And those, I think, will replace or at least extend the more typical top-down 20th century governance systems that we've, we've all grown up with. The capacity to link knowledge and action is also critical. We know that the effectiveness of decision-making for sustainability is influenced by lots of different things, but it, there is no doubt that science, scientific knowledge can help. Unfortunately, that knowledge has too often been too little, too late, and sometimes not helpful at all on the wrong things. Research and practical experience over the last decade or two have clearly demonstrated the inadequacies of that pipeline or that loading dock approach to usable knowledge. You know, these are approaches where the research community thinks they know what the questions are. They carry out research, they um, you know finish it up, and they put it out there, hoping that some decision makers will use it. Um, you know, we have to get out of the ivory tower. Uh, a decade of, or more of research has shown that this doesn't work. This development of trusted and useful knowledge um, re requires ongoing dialogue and communication and collaboration and very often co-production that includes both researchers and decision makers. And we're learning how to do that and how the importance of boundary spanning organizations of decision support entities and we're also learning how to do that at scales that will reach knowledge to a lot of different actors. And again, in that area, power matters. It's, you know, who, in the, who is in the conversation matters. The diversity of expertise and experience of the participants at the table actually, in the end, influences perceptions of fairness and credibility and usefulness. So um, and these are important things for the research community to know. And again, we're training up a next generation of researchers who understand how to more effectively link with actors in action. Um, but I think decision makers of all sorts also need to understand that. Now, finally, and I'll finish up here, um, sustainability really is all about fostering equitable improvements in the well-being of people today and over, the gener over future generations. And, and that differentiates the pursuit of sustainability from other social goals. Justice, equity, fairness, and inclusion are essential for sustainability goals to be met. We now recognize the need to engage a broad range of actors, of, of different you know, people and organizations, diversity of types of knowledge and ways of knowing and experience and values in order to work successfully towards sustainability solutions. And research and practice are devising different ways of actually doing that, of, of bringing that, of, of hearing all voices. Um, but, you know, participants at our workshop also suggested, and, and I agree with this, that among the six themes that we're, we've discussed, this one may be the least well understood and developed. We repeatedly heard the words embrace plurality and equity in all of our sessions. And, and it remains, I think, for all of us to learn very quickly how to do so and apply that broadly in our pursuit of sustainability. So I wanna thank you very much for listening. If you're interested in more information on these, uh, these topics discussed at the workshop, much more depth on all of them, you can use these links. But meanwhile, thank you again for uh, having us here. Professor Matson, thank you as always. Our economies, livelihoods and well-being all depend on our most precious asset, nature. This is a quote from the Descapta Review, The Economics of Biodiversity, which came earlier this year, and it really caught my eye. It's not often economy and nature are mentioned in the same sentence, although they are heavily intertwined. To give us more insights on this subject, I am delighted to present the man not only behind the review, but the most renowned economist in this field. 
Coming to us live from Cambridge, good evening, Professor Zapata Daskapta. The screen is yours. Sorry, I'm um, inefficient. I have not unmuted myself. It's a great honor to be here, uh, to be amongst friends, even although we are dispersed. Not so long ago, the economic questions requiring urgent attention could be studied by excluding nature from formal economic reasoning. As it made sense to focus on the accumulation of produced capital, roads, buildings, ports, machines, and human capital, health and education. The reason is that the end of the Second World War, Europe was devastated, the Far East was devastated, they needed reconstruction, and soon after, num large numbers of countries became independent of colonial rule, and the idea of economic development loomed large, and it was but natural to think in terms of the accumulation of produced capital and human capital, and keeping nature at a distance. Unfortunately, the resulting macroeconomic models of growth and development so directed the way economists in academia, national governments, and international organizations collect and analyze data today, that it has become a commonplace that we can bypass nature in our economic lives. This is a profound error. Nature is our home, she is our most precious asset. The belief that we can bypass nature has been strengthened by the fact that the average person today enjoys a far higher income, is less likely to be in absolute poverty, and lives significantly longer than she did even 70 years ago. That's the end of the Second World War, or a few years after. Since 1950, the global expectancy of life at birth has risen from 46 years to 73 years. The world economy has grown more than 15-fold to over $130 trillion GDP a year at purchasing power parity. Global per capita income has increased more than five-fold to over $17,000, again, at purchasing power parity. And there are 5.3 billion more people today to enjoy that increase. For a world population today, it's 7.8 billion. It would seem then that we are living in the very best of times. And indeed, large numbers of books are routinely written to express that jubilation. But even while we have enjoyed the fruits of economic growth, the demands we have made of nature's goods and services have for some decades exceeded her ability to supply them on a sustainable basis. Because the difference between demand and sustainable supply is met by a degradation of nature, the gap has been increasing threatening our descendants' lives. We have been collectively damaging nature at an alarming rate with biodiversity declining faster than at any time in human history and even before. It's almost like we're like a crowd of people on a hanging bridge trying to keep balance and then bringing it down crashingly. By one inevitably very crude estimate, the ratio of demand to sustainable supply is today approximately 1.6, which provides the image that we need 1.6 Earths to meet our current demands. It would seem then that we are also living at the worst of times. Nature is an asset, like produced capital and human capital. But like education and health, nature is not merely an economic good. We all rely on goods and services nature supplies, and my review goes into this the ecological and environmental science of the matter in great detail, but nature's worth goes beyond its use value. Aspects of it have intrinsic, even sacred value. Moreover, we are embedded in nature. We are not external to her. Once we include these aspects of nature in our lives, the economics of biodiversity becomes a study in portfolio management. This too should be of no surprise, for we are all asset managers. Whether as farmers or fishermen, foresters or miners, households or firms, governments or charities, we each manage our assets in line with our motivation and the constraints we face. So then why are we collectively failing to manage our global portfolio of assets? 
A central reason is that nature's work to society is not reflected in market prices. Nature is mobile, she's silent, and she's invisible often. Just think of what's going on under our feet in what's known as a pedosphere, i.e. in the soils, and you'll get the sense of what I mean. It is hard to trace the consequences, often deleterious consequences, of human actions to those who are responsible for them. That makes it very hard for markets to function well. But it isn't simply a case of market failure. It is broadly an institutional failure. Our institutions have been unable to create the necessary in incentives for us to economize our use of nature's fundamental services. The open oceans and the atmosphere are global public goods we all benefit from. We use the, the, we use the former for fishing and for transportation, but don't pay rent for that use. And we use the latter as a sink for our carbon emissions, and yet we don't pay a price for emissions. Worse, government subsidized the use of nature to the extent of some four to six trillion US dollars annually. That's five to 7% of global GDP. In effect, we pay ourselves to exploit rather than protect our home. So we need a transformative change to correct for the imbalance. The review identifies three broad transitions that are needed, and I'm going to list them in the, what remains of my time. Firstly, we need to address the imbalance between our demands on nature and its supply. On the one hand, this means setting ambitious global targets for meaningful conservation and restoration, and invest more in nature to increase the quantity and quality of our stocks of natural assets. Those are means of, for increasing, there are means of, for increasing productivity of nature. On the other hand, we need to remove those subsidies so as to reduce the demands we make on nature because they'll become more costly to use. The latter includes expansion of foreign aid in the form of family planning and reproductive services to developing regions that are yet far from enjoying fertility transition. We also need devices to, to restructure our consumption and production patterns and to further reduce our demands on nature. One such device would be the requirement that firms disclose the characteristics of their entire supply chain from source to sink. Disclosure is a substitute for imperfect markets. The review goes into great detail into why, what the logic underlying the need for disclosure is. Secondly, we need to change our measures of economic success, a point that has been raised before today. While GDP is indispensable in short-run macroeconomic analysis, it does not account for the depreciation of assets and is therefore wholly unsuitable for identifying how to develop sustainably. Governments and business, businesses alike need to routine, uh, routinize natural capital accounting. This will serve as a critical step towards making inclusive wealth, uh, and by that I mean the sum of our produced human and natural capital, the value of them, our key measure of progress. Private companies produce balance sheets to augment their income expenditure accounts. So too, national governments should produce balance sheets to augment their income expenditure accounts. Finally, we must transform our institutions, particularly our financial and educational systems, to enable those changes to take place at a global scale. Both public and private financial actors have a role to play in re reorienting financial flows towards enhancing our natural assets and far more support is needed to improve awareness among businesses and financial institutions of their dependencies, impacts, and risks associated with the degradation of nature. Let me give you one example of the institutional changes that the review suggests. At the end of the Second World War, the, global, the, the, the community of nations had the courage of conviction to establish the World Bank, the IMF, and we now have other institutions like the WHO, FAO, which are responsible for managing global public goods. We now need desperately an international institution with the authority to monitor and manage global public goods like the open seas for which we do not pay anything and the ocean uh, and the atmosphere. However, as much of as beca because much of nature is silent and invisible, Institutions cannot be expected to eliminate all of the negative impacts of our activities have on nature. Citizens therefore have to serve both as judge and jury for their own actions. Citizens need to be empowered not only to demand the changes that are needed 
in our demands on nature. And many of those demands are at the local level, but also to make informed decisions about their own individual impact on the natural environment. And that cannot happen without enabling individuals, above all through educational policy, to understand and appreciate the workings of the natural world. That's the conclusion in the sense that because nature is silent, mobile and invisible, you, no institution can manage to monitor what we do to it. We each have to be our judge and jury. And the educational suggest the suggestions that the view concludes, right, that we all need to become in part naturalists. And the only way we can is to begin the earlier stages of our lives to learn something about this wonderful home we live in. And to love something, you require an understanding. And understanding, of course, is the basis for science. Thank you very much. Professor Sapata Descapta, thank you as always. Her Royal Highness talked eloquently about the ship in the Suez Canal and how nature finally came to the rescue. That poor stranded ship also reminded us of how crucial the ocean is for our infrastructure. Around 90% of all goods travel across the globe by ship. Furthermore, the oceans produce half of the oxygen we breathe, moderate the temperature of the planet, provide millions of jobs and feed billions of people. When it comes to sustainability, every ocean is a key player. When it comes to sustainability and the oceans, the Honorable Dr. Jane Lubchenko is a key person. She was recently appointed a high-level position coordinating climate and environmental issues within the Biden administration. Coming to us live from Washington, I am so delighted to give the floor to the Honorable Dr. Jane Lubchenko. Thank you, Caroline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My thanks to the Nobel Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, the Potsdam Institute, the Stockholm Resilience Center, and the Bayer Institute for bringing us together for this first ever Nobel Prize Summit, Our Planet, Our Future. My colleagues have eloquently articulated the compelling need to harness knowledge, accelerate awareness, and transform practices and policies that will enable a transition to a sustainable and resilient future. They make the case that our future is intimately tied to the natural world, that solutions to major crises facing humanity are possible, but only if we become better stewards of nature, of the living planet, and of each other. In listening to them, I was reminded of the words of the population geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky, who said, quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, unquote. With apologies to, to Dobzhansky, my colleague's remarks might be partly captured with the words, nothing in the future makes sense or is even possible without nature. I'm also reminded of John W. Gardner's words that, quote, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as insoluble problems, unquote. And make no mistake, the challenges facing us are real. They are daunting, but as you have heard, they are not insurmountable. I'm here today to tell you that the ocean not only encapsulates all of these problems, and opportunities, it also offers common ground and opportunity for people to solve seemingly intractable problems and co-create a vibrant shared future. The ocean is a central player in our biosphere, in our lives, and in our future, even though for most people it is out of sight, out of mind. The ocean is not only our past, 
but I believe it is our future. It feeds and sustains us. It connects us. Since time immemorial, the ocean has been the grocery store, the pharmacy, the playground, and the highway for people around the world. The ocean regulates our climate and produces our weather. It is the lifeblood and the identity of diverse cultures. The ocean is also an unfathomable library, most of whose books we cannot yet read, but which surely contain treasures of undiscovered knowledge. And the ocean is a source of inspiration as well as knowledge. One of Chile's Nobel laureates in literature, Pablo Neruda, whose poems and coastal residents are infused with oceanic influences, wrote, Necesito del mar porque me enseña. I need the sea because it teaches me. And halfway around the world from South Africa, the film My Octopus Teacher, which just two days ago won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Film Feature, provides additional insights and inspiration. In short, the ocean feeds our bodies, our spirits, and our minds. But the living ocean is at risk, and therefore so are we. Through ignorance and arrogance, we have squandered the beauty and the bounty of the ocean, undermined the ability of ocean ecosystems to provide the life support systems that we need and want. Moreover, they have introduced significant inequities that disproportionately play out to the poor and most vulnerable people around the world. Especially over the last half century, the ocean has been depleted and disrupted with devastating consequences to many people. Climate change and ocean acidification, habitat destruction, overfishing and destructive fishing gear, mining, oil and gas exploration and extraction, nutrient, toxin, and plastic pollution from the land all take their toll. The 2019 IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and the Cryosphere documents in frankly depressing detail the massive impacts of climate change and its equally evil twin ocean acidification on the ocean. The ocean is now warmer, more acidic, less productive, and less predictable. These impacts are devastating on multiple fronts. For many fisheries in the developed and developing worlds alike, with consequences to health economies and opportunities for development. For entire ecosystems like coral reefs, kelp forests, and mangrove forests that are home to rich biodiversity, support lives and livelihoods through fisheries and tourism, protect coastal communities from storm surge and coastal erosion, and capture or store vast amounts of carbon. Unfortunately, this doomy portrayal is all too real. But as daunting as the challenges are, the problems are not insurmountable. We know that ocean ecosystems can be resilient and can recover if stressors are removed soon enough. We know that people who depend upon the ocean can be resilient. For example, we have seen depleted fisheries recover following implementation of fishery reforms. We have seen depleted and disrupted ocean habitats recover following implementation of marine protected areas or MPAs that are fully and highly protected. In both instances, science-based policies that were deployed using the right incentives and the necessary enabling conditions provided the secret sauce for success. In truth, there are thousands of great efforts underway to recover the bounty of the ocean and to use it wisely. We have solutions. They are powerful. But those efforts, those solutions are not at the scale or pace that is needed, and certainly not that is commensurate with the magnitude of the challenges. New science, new awareness, 
and new solutions are emerging. They're bubbling up all over the world from civil society, from industry, financial and governmental sectors. And this is painting a picture of opportunity and hope. Novel partnerships, for example, are demonstrating the power of taking a holistic, integrated nature society approach, combining perspectives and co-creating solutions. Here are three quick examples. The 14 heads of state and government that came together as the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, representing 30% of the world's EEZs and 20% of fisheries and 20% of shipping, are actively pursuing the triple bottom line win of protect effectively, produce sustainably, and prosper equitably. The three together. Protect effectively, produce sustainably, and prosper equitably. The 10 CEOs of some of the world's largest seafood companies have formed a unique partnership with scientists and industry leaders called CBOS to chart a course towards sustainable and climate smart fisheries and aquaculture. The Friends of Ocean and Climate Nations last week convened a side event just prior to President Biden's Climate Leaders Summit to draw attention to the opportunities for the ocean to contribute significantly to the achievement of the net zero goal. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, Hawaii's Governor David Ige joined nine presidents, prime ministers and ministers from around the globe to announce significant commitments to tap the potential of ocean-based solutions to mitigate climate change. The commitments they announced echoed the findings from a scientific report commissioned by the Ocean Panel that concluded that ocean-based activities could contribute as much as 21%, one-fifth of the greenhouse gas emission reductions that are needed to get us to the 1.5 degree target by 2050. Those activities include ocean renewable energy, decarbonizing shipping, protecting and restoring blue carbon ecosystems, the salt marshes, mangroves, seagrass beds, and more. Clearly, the ocean can play a central role in addressing the climate crisis. It has not really been a go-to place for mitigation. It needs to be, it can be, it should be. In similar fashion, the ocean is central to addressing the food security crisis. Currently, about 3 billion people depend on seafood as a significant source of protein. A recent scientific paper in Nature by Costello et al. estimated that if managed properly, the ocean could produce up to six times more sustainable seafood than it does today by 2050. And New analyses are suggesting that the biodiversity crisis can be tackled in ways that facilitate simultaneous achievement of climate and food security goals. A recent paper in Nature by Sala et al. presents an innovative approach to use fully and highly protected MPAs to achieve three simultaneous goals of biodiversity protection, carbon storage to help with the climate crisis, and food provisioning. Imagine being able to incorporate the carbon stored in MPAs as part of a country's NDCs. So new science and new partnerships are driving new awareness and action. Novel partnerships are creating opportunities with co-benefits across multiple dimensions of simultaneous crises confronting humanity. And we are seeing increasingly how central the ocean is to our future. In short, the ocean encapsulates the broader planetary challenges and it offers solutions and hope. As a consequence, we're seeing a new narrative about the ocean emerge. The evolution of narratives about the ocean are reflective of a broader evolution of our thinking about planetary challenges and our role. I believe that narratives are important because they reflect and help shape our thinking and our action. So the 
ocean narrative that has existed for pretty much as long as people have been on the planet is that the ocean is so immense, it's so bountiful, it's so resilient, it would be impossible to deplete or disrupt it. This was the narrative that people had about the ocean for thousands and thousands of years. The ocean was thought to be so vast, it was thought to be too big to fail. This mindset persists today and drives even greater and more intense exploitation and unsustainable uses that reflect ignorance, the allure of new economic opportunity, failed uh, failures to incorporate the kind of economic valuation approaches of nature that Professor Dasgupta just alluded to, or the urgent need for resources. But we are also seeing graphic evidence of the folly of this not too big to, of this too big to fail narrative in the news about collapsed fisheries, leached coral reefs, hungry people, images of plastic pollution. But when people ponder this evidence, this overwhelming bad stuff that's happening in the ocean, all too often they become quickly overwhelmed and depressed. A doom and gloom mindset takes over. We see a similar phenomenon with climate change. The problems can appear too complex, the vested interests too powerful, system inertia seems too great. And so a second narrative about the ocean has emerged recently. This narrative says that the ocean is massively and fatally depleted and disrupted. The ocean is too big to fix. That narrative can easily lead to depression, lack of engagement, with no motivation to help address the problems. However, despite the undeniable challenges, and not surprisingly, given what I said earlier, there are hints of a new mindset emerging. A new third narrative is building on the powerful solutions that already exist and would seek to replicate, accelerate, and escalate these solutions for greater progress. And it could stimulate and needs to stimulate the creation of additional solutions based on greater efficiency, more appropriate incentives, better accounting, new technological and biotech solutions, and regenerative holistic approaches like my colleagues have been talking about. For those innovations to succeed, they must take a holistic approach, reflecting the need to consider earth system science through the lens of this coupled human natural systems. In this fashion, we seek solutions that bring co-benefits to poverty, hunger, economic development, that address inequity, but also focus on peace and security and that pay close attention to coastal resilience and adaptation going forward. I believe that the new emerging narrative could be quite powerful. I understand that a new narrative does not automatically change the status quo, but it can reset our expectations and liberate, inspire ingenuity. This new narrative acknowledges that the ocean is so central to our future it's too important to neglect. It notes the opportunities for ocean-based solutions to mitigate and adapt to climate change. It notes the opportunities for sustainable fisheries and aquaculture to significantly contribute to food security. And it shines a spotlight on ways to protect biodiversity while simultaneously contributing to food provisioning and meeting the climate crisis. In short, we are seeing the emergence of a new narrative for the ocean. The ocean is indeed our past, but it is also key to the future. The nature society connections in the ocean are clear. A new narrative that embraces the inherent co complexity of the nature society complex adaptive systems is urgently needed. People are inextricably linked and ultimately dependent upon the ocean. In short, 
It is in our own interest, as well as our responsibility, to be good stewards of the ocean. The ocean is not too big to fail, nor is it too big to fix, but it is too central and too important to ignore. So in healing the ocean, we can heal ourselves. Time is wasting, dive in. Thank you. Thank you as always, Professor Lubchenko. Whether it is dancing, entrepreneurship, or basically anything, every self-respecting program these days has its own panel of reviewers. And of course, we couldn't settle for less. Since this is an academic science session, we have gathered the most prominent commentators we could think of. They are here to give their reflections on the white paper and the four speakers we just have listened to. It's a true pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Richard Horton, Editor-in-Chief of The Lancet, Mrs. Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of Nature, and Mr. Holden Thorpe, Editor-in-Chief of Science Magazine. Mr. Horton, the screen is yours. Thank you so much and welcome from London. Um, I'm delighted that uh, Professor Lubchenko mentioned My Octopus Teacher. Don't listen to me. Please go and watch that wonderful film. It's a film that not only shows the value and importance of protecting biodiverse environments, but also, also offers a powerful and inspiring plea to rethink our relationship with all forms of life on our planet. It's a film that questions our often simplistic assumptions about intelligence, sentience and consciousness across the animal kingdom. Um, my oh my, do we need inspiration today as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to devastate nations. And you will have all seen, and we should acknowledge, the truly shocking and heartbreaking scenes that are coming from India this week. And we certainly need to use this moment to question our long-held assumptions about our present and future. Optimistically, I think the pandemic does provide uh, a moment to redraw the contours, uh, the boundaries, uh, the confidence intervals for the future of the biosphere. So I just have two reflections on what we've already heard from the keynotes and the um, position paper. First, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is our greatest opportunity of a generation to redefine the goals of humanity. Those who are most marginalized and excluded in our societies, those who are usually invisible and taken for granted, are now at the center of the political stage and our common discussion. There has been a redistribution of esteem across our societies and a revivification of our moral concern for one another. The importance of cooperation and not competition, multilateralism and not nationalism to solve global challenges have been underlined. And trust, integrity, and truth telling have been seen to be the foundation for good government and governance. And when they are absent, we've seen that that is the cause of terrible and preventable human suffering. But my second reflection is that that once in a generation opportunity is contingent on us accepting and embracing three understandings about our current predicament. One, that COVID-19 is not a pandemic. It is a syndemic, a synthesis of epidemics. It is a virus that has exploited pre-existing biological vulnerabilities across our societies, chronically poor population health, 
and social fragilities, poverty and inequality. Two, that 40 years of neoliberalism, the intensification of market mechanisms for solving social problems can be seen for what it is, a failed experiment that has not only created a culture of personal misery, but has also fatally undermined human dignity for billions of our fellow citizens on this planet. And three, that the response to this pandemic has proven the inextricable interdependence of science with society. Research has delivered in real time contributions that have saved countless lives. So science must not only be strengthened in all nations in response to this pandemic, but also must become more fully integrated into policymaking and politics. We're supposed to be living, it's been mentioned already, in the Anthropocene, an era based on the premise that our species is the most profound influence on the future of Earth. Well, perhaps. Yet a coronavirus has challenged our supposed omnipotence and certainly has punctured our hubris. So let's use this new age of humility to grasp an opportunity to redescribe who we are, what we want, and how we will achieve it. Thank you. And greetings to all of you, also from London. Guided by the science um, is a phrase I heard from my government almost on a daily basis throughout uh, 2020. Uh, the context was, of course, the ongoing pandemic. And uh, on a global scale, we all watched how strategies to deal with the pandemic succeeded or failed, depending on how closely they followed advice of researchers and medical professionals. I do not believe this audience needs convincing that science must be at the center of the solutions to the problems that we face. Solutions must be evidence-based. The real question, I believe, is how to harness scientific guidance, which at times may seem to be at odds with other priorities. In my view, we must look to collaborations and partnerships to breaking down the silos between governments, the finance, business, and research sectors, and the wider society. Crucially, we must also break down the silos within the research ecosystem. Climate change, energy crisis, loss of biodiversity, food crisis, and poverty will require solutions from across research disciplines that range from anthropology through to zoology. It is time, however, for not only multidisciplinary solutions, but interdisciplinary ones. We should therefore look to reimagine our education systems, a point that has been made already, so that we can train a new generation of researchers who identify as true interdisciplinarians. And multidisciplinary journals, such as the one I lead, Nature, can truly come into their own at time like this, by providing a venue and a platform for disseminating such research. We must also embrace research from academia and industry alike and accelerate a growing appreciation of the powerful synergy between lessons from micro scale, local examples, analyses, and data with the global large scale models. The power of collaboration extends beyond the research sector. Just as science has guided governments during the pandemic, it should guide the post-pandemic reboot, for example, future investments. The Biden administration is planning to focus its financial support of public agencies on those that work in climate change and environmental protection. The World Bank and the IMF would do well, in my view, to take a leaf out of this book. Science can and should help guide investments and lending criteria. 
We are seeing one country after another pledging carbon neutrality ahead of this year's COP. These are incredibly positive developments, but unfortunately, the pledges are made in the absence of a definition of what net zero actually means. This is important because researchers tell us that different definitions and pathways to net zero can have drastically different outcomes, including whether or not the Paris Agreement target is actually met. There is now also a growing momentum towards protecting 30% of the planet by 2030. And last December, the 30% ocean goal was backed by the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy of which you just heard a couple of minutes ago. And it was a beautiful illustration of how tensions between the priorities of governments, the conservation community and industry can be ameliorated when all parties place, place trust in real world evidence provided by multidisciplinary research teams. And we are reaching similar conclusions for the food systems and biodiversity, of course. Science is helping identify synergies where previously the world saw mainly tensions. My call for collaborations and partnerships extends beyond the sphere of experts and professionals echoing previous comments. UN Declaration of Human Rights refers to science as expression of human dignity. Science belongs to us all and everyone should be included. Let us therefore make it our goal that our discussions and recommendations resonate with every human being on this planet. That the theme, our planet, our future, rings true to everyone, regardless who they are, where they come from and where they live. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. And do I need to do anything? Okay, sorry. Uh, it's great to be with you all. I'm coming to you from Central Florida, but hopefully one day soon from 1200 New York Avenue. And it's always great to be with my colleagues Magdalena Skipper and Richard Horton, who uh, do so much to promote rigorous scholarship and science uh, around the world. I want to talk about some things that were raised by the speakers, linking knowledge with action and fostering equity as raised by Dr. Madsen, the need for all of us to become naturalists as uh, raised by uh, Dr. Dasgupta, and, and a new narrative, which we need to not only develop, but also install in society as raised by Jane Lubchenco. And uh, Richard and Magdalena and I did not plan all our comments, but it just shows how much time we spend reading each other's editorials and being together on Zoom that uh, our messages are so well coordinated. So I thank them for their comments. I want to appeal to the scientists who are university faculty to help us develop a population that is more comfortable with scientific information and process. It is true that the digital monster of misinformation and disinformation carried out by autocratic politicians and enabled by handwashing tech companies pose a great threat to the appreciation for scientific information and expertise. But we can't expect to take on those threats until we have our own house in order. We have known for 20 years or more that our old teaching methods of large lectures and high stakes testing don't cut it. They were optimized at a time when European males were the only people learning in higher education and are not optimized for women and people of color. Study after study has shown that inclusive teaching methods will allow a more diverse population to thrive in science and yet the movement toward these enlightened science teaching methods in universities around the world is minuscule. Similarly, science faculty continue to insist that degrees are crammed full of redundant didactic material, and they hide behind guidelines from organizations like the Accreditation Board of Engineering Technology and the American Chemical Society, my society, 
to justify bludgeoning students with course after course of memorized facts and equations, while research shows that greater learning takes place when stu students need to use material, not regurgitate it on a test. This obsession further raises the barrier to entry and crowds out courses in the humanities and social sciences that could help future scientists understand the implications of their work, such as the societal implications of climate change. It makes no sense to bemoan the lack of science literacy in the world when we are still playing such a large role in excluding people from science and making it hard for the public to understand our ideas and methods. As a former university administrator, I've heard all of the excuses. It's the fault of K through 12 education. We can't water down our subjects. The students just don't work hard enough. I don't buy it. We have the collective power as a scientific community to stop weeding people out and start weeding them in. The pandemic has provided a reset point on our teaching, just as Richard said, a reset point on so many things, but the way we teach science has also been reset when we had to move online. When we go back to the classroom, let's stop droning on and writing on the blackboard. Let's stop cramming equation after equation into our classes and let's leave room in our curricula for students to learn not just science, but also what to do with it. Confronting these failures is a concrete way to a more enlightened populace that will partner with us on solving big problems like pandemics and climate change. By making science more accessible, we can create a world of lifelong inquisitive learners who will better care for the earth and its people. Thank you for giving me the chance to share something with you today. It's an honor to be with you all. Mr. Hawthorne, Mrs. Skipper and Mr. Thorpe, thank you for your insights and interesting comments. We are now going to listen to our first dialogue. Science supporting transformations towards global sustainability. This is the part where our specially invited Nobel Prize laureates and experts have the opportunity to comment and pose questions to the panelists. And yes, we do have a pro who is going to share this very special panel. She is professor at the University of Michigan, professor at the University of Maryland. She is also a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. Coming to us live from Ann Arbor, Michigan, I am so delighted to give the floor to Professor Rosina Beerbaum. Thank you so much, Caroline. Welcome, everyone. We have heard now that the science needs are great and the time to achieve global sustainability is short. We need to get to transformational change and not incrementally. So we are very honored now to have a conversation with four people at the forefront of thinking about science in the service of society. Their bios are long and illustrious, but just a few points about each. Uh, Professor Brian Schmidt, the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics for providing evidence that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. He's the only Montana-born Nobel laureate, and he also is a great baker, apparently of fruit tarts in particular, and a vintner. Then we have Dr. Marcia McNutt, known to all, I think, as the president of the National Academy of Sciences, a former editor of science, and a former director of the US Geological Survey. Uh, despite being discouraged in college from becoming a physicist, she graduated summa cum laude in physics. She is also an expert horsewoman and a barrel racer. Professor Yuan Se Li, or YT, Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1986 for contributing to the dynamics of chemical elementary processes using crossed molecular beams. He is the first Taiwanese Nobelist 
And he is a fan of baseball and, of course, of his famous father's art. Professor Hans Joachim Schellenhuber, or John, asked me to introduce him as a simple physicist. <laughs> he is the founding director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research, known as PIC, and he's also the winner of the Volvo and Blue Planet Prizes. John is very clever at phrasing. His goal for climate change is to avoid the unmanageable and to manage the unavoidable. Um, all of us are professors and therefore accustomed to speaking in 50 minute increments, but we agreed to responses of no more than two minutes and we'll see if we can. Um, please do put questions in the chat and we'll get to them if we adhere to the time constraints. Okay, so our first round of questions are gonna focus on the what science is needed now for transformational change. So let me turn to you, John, first. What science do we need now to tackle those increasingly interconnected complex challenges we've heard about, biodiversity loss, climate change, pandemics, and inequality? I mean, it's clear we can no longer adhere to disciplinary silos um, or individual solutions, and, and, and even our global models don't model distributional out puts at or outcomes at a fine enough grain level to understand increasing inequality. So what can science do to rapidly make progress? Yeah, so thank you, Lucina. Um, let me follow up directly on what uh, Professor Göran Hansen said in the beginning. He was referring to the ozone layer, to the Montreal Protocol and our memory of two heroes of science, namely Mario Molina, and Paul Crutzen, it so happened that my retrospective on Paul Crutzen was published in PNAS this week. And you know, if you look at that uh, in the beautiful Nobel Prize lecture of uh, Paul Crutzen, he showed that humanity had a very narrow escape. If we would have used after the Second World War or developed bromine chemistry instead of chlorine chemistry, probably the ozone layer would have been destroyed irreversibly, actually. Yeah? And it shows a huge chart of complicated reactions and so on. And I am thinking about, are we really aware of the system's risks? Risks to system Earth to destroy, actually, the ecosphere, the biosphere we talk about, existential risks, so to speak. And I show you the cover of a book uh, that I always keep with me, The Eerie Silence, that is by Paul Davis. It's about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, and the question is, why is this silence? Uh, why don't we hear anything from the universe, so to speak? And that probably has to do with the so-called Drake's equation, where the critical factor is the average lifetime of a technical intelligence. Uh, and if this is considered to be 200 or 500 years only, when it's explained why we don't hear anything from extraterrestrial intelligence. So what I'm saying is, in order to look at climate change, biodiversity loss, soil depletion and so on, the oceans, change of change, we'll talk about it. I think we need to do a sort of systems analysis, complex systems analysis of existential risks. These risks are out there. Eh? The bromine catastrophe, we had a narrow escape without even knowing about it, actually. Eh? But I'm sure there are many existential systemic risks in the pipeline, and science has to simply start to look for them. And actually, I have to say, and that is the, the end of my initial remark, I mean, 10 years ago, even, it was almost taboo in science to even think about these things, uh, because this was the doomsaying and so on. But we should be aware we had a narrow escape 20, 30 years ago, and now the next big thing may emerge. So radical systems analysis, complex systems analysis of the whole planetary machinery and how to do it I will tell you a little bit later if, if you give me a chance in the second or third round. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Yes, yeah, systems thinking we definitely need and risk risk assessment 
that looks not just as so commonly is done at the economic risk, but equally important as we've been hearing from the previous speakers, uh, the ecological and the social risks. Um, so Brian, let me turn to you next. And I think an area that we would all admit is very much understudied um, is the area of adaptation to climate change. And you are a vineyard owner and a foodie, as I mentioned earlier, but, but quite seriously. Given the important intersections of the food, the water and energy systems, what science do you think we need to quickly advance adaptive capacity, indeed transformationally? Well, it's hard to know where to start because we effectively need to advance any place that humanity intersects uh, with the nature that we've been talking about. So quite obviously, uh, we have an issue of food security and as uh, our climate changes, the places where we grow our food is are going to change, and uh, we are going to struggle to combat that that change. We need to adapt, but fortunately, we do have uh, technology on our side to help us. For example, we have the ability to do precision agriculture, where we understand hybrids and adapt hybrids uh, as the climate changes. And we need to make sure we do this not just for the developed world. Of course, uh, most of the people of the world are in the uh, developing world. And so that precision agriculture has to be applicable to uh, Asia, to Africa. And so uh, developed economies such as Australia, Europe, the US need to be focusing a huge amount of their research, not just for ourselves, but for those areas around us. Uh, Jane talked very much around the ocean. That is the other place where we see huge amounts of the developing world coming direct contact with what is both uh, a threat and an opportunity. As indicated, huge productivity gains are possible out of the ocean. But as John has just said, you have to be careful what you do, because if you think only narrowly about an opportunity, you may set off a cascading set of events that actually causes more harm than good. Here in Australia, we look very much to the Pacific, and we see both the threats and the opportunity for uh, the island nations of the Pacific, who in some cases are literally going to be submerged by the rising oceans. But we also see the ability to, if we can increase, as I said, both the agriculture uh, and the aquaculture, there are places where those uh, communities may perhaps uh, thrive. Finally, we have huge opportunities of looking at how cities work for humans, being able to go through and work in incredibly sustainable uh, methods within cities as possible. Uh, it's not something we think so much about, but humanity is only concentrated in those areas and where I see there are huge opportunities as well. Thank you so much for that. And, and as a, a once ecologist, might I add that also, in addition to simply protecting areas, whether they be in the land or ocean, we need to think increasingly uh, about um, intact ecosystems so that the capacity to provide ecosystem services and perhaps migration needed as climate change proceeds at pace uh, would also be an important adaptation. Um, uh, let me turn now to Marsha. Um, you, you know, you work very hard to make science usable. And, and there is a real disconnect, I think, between what the academic world produces and what the practitioner world can actually use. And, and especially important as we're trying to um, lift people out of poverty, enhance livelihoods, and, and increase sustainability all at once. So can you speak about how we can cross this academic practice divide? Sure, Rosina. So my view is that whether or not we achieve our climate goals, a lot will depend on how we reach out to the developing world. We do not have the time nor the carbon budget to allow them to follow the same torturous path that the developed world took from uh, using carbon-based sources to build their economies, and then finally deciding, oh, well, no, we're going to switch to renewables. We have to help the developing world leapfrog technologies. Honestly, I scream in anguish every time I hear that a bank or some other funder has uh, put forward the money 
to establish another coal-fired power plant in the developing world. But by leapfrogging technologies, and that is going directly to uh, electricity generation that is free of carbon pollution, going directly to electrified end uses, and then building the infrastructure to get the energy from the source to um, the user, this is something that we can help the developing world do and uh, not avoid entirely the path that we took to um, uh, plentiful energy. Uh, a good example of leapfrogging technologies is what was done with cell phones. When uh, advanced communications were being established in many developing countries, they didn't do it like Ma Bell did in this country by putting up wires and telephone poles across their nations. They leapfrogged immediately to uh, wireless technology. And uh, it, it certainly was um, a much better solution. And uh, I would say the same thing for these uh, decarbonized energy sources. We know that pollution from burning fossil fuels is responsible for human health impacts, as well as, of course, the environmental impacts. So in terms of looking at the equity issue, we can help these nations go directly towards um, solutions that are cheaper, um, better for the environment, and better for the people themselves. I think the academic community needs to create roadmaps for doing this. Uh, I have um, a sister-in-law and brother-in-law who graduated from Stanford and went to Kenya to help Kenya uh, develop reliable energy in, in that nation and that was uh, clean and um, helped with uh, producing the uh, levels of energy that were needed for manufacturing, greenhouses, and other uh, things. So this is all possible, but we just have to make it uh, a priority. Thank you, Marcia. So we really need key info transfer to explain that tech transfer can, in fact, uh, be a way to leapfrog. Um, YT, you know, historically, the centrality, if you will, of the harder sciences, shall we say, physics, chemistry, and biology, ha have identified all these environmental problems that we face. Um, what do you see now as the research needed in social sciences to help design solutions? Well, we all understand that the sunshine brought us all here. I mean, humanity and nature. But we are in the process of changing fossil fuel into solar energy. In that process, we've been successful in transforming sunshine to electricity, but now we are in the process to learn how to store it, transform it. And it's interesting when we talk about social scientists. I think when I was teaching at the University of Chicago, all the students has to learn the core curriculum. Scientists has to learn social sciences, social scientists and humanities students has to learn hard sciences. And we, we do not have done that. It's not possible to have a social scientist take the leadership and understand what to do. So Westheimer once said, US higher education is rotten through the core. So we really have to come back to the core education. Social scientists has to learn hard science to be able to deal with the complex problem. I don't think there's a simple solution just to say, do one, two, three. <laughs> That's right. I, 
Thank you so much. I, I think, you know, we, we have learned, though, that often an identified technology that could, quote, solve the problem, if no one wants it, won't be a solution. And so somehow figuring out what, what types of technologies are wanted and acceptable um, seem to be increasingly important in, in uh, the practitioner world and in the kind of leapfrogging that, that we just heard um, Marsha speak about. And so somehow I think we have to uh, avoid just adding on a, a token social scientist in some of our big assessments, but include them more centrally as, as has been happening too in recent years. So thank you for that. Um, we wanted to move to round two. And, and so we've been hearing some finer grained how um, and now I want to uh, move more into uh, additional features of this transformational change with some specifics. And Brian, I wanted to turn to you because we're seeing increasingly that the private sector and the philanthropic organizations are, are funding R&D. And that seems to be fundamentally changing the historic public-private science relationship. And so I'm wondering, given that we're trying to think about transformational change, how these public private relationships can be rapidly leveraged to scale up. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, I think it's actually quite a uh, great advancement. One of the problems we have is when we're trying to solve these problems around national boundaries, which is how a lot of research is funded, you tend to think of things along national boundaries. And what we've been hearing here is it's a global system. So when you get philanthropists able to come in and literally leverage each country, they can build up a system. And so we've seen this a bit around, uh, for example, the Gates Foundation and how we, we deal with uh, systemic global issues uh, using all of humanity's uh, you know, talents. And so I think they have been able to get around some of these, uh, these global issues. The reality is that the private sector funding uh, at this point actually is quite small relative to the uh, governmental funding, but it has been able to leverage it very, very effectively, and quite interesting, ends up getting almost as much attention. So I think we need to learn from those great systems thinkers uh, and take the funding of the research, uh, learn from the opportunities, and we need to expand it. We need to think globally, and so why not have the Europeans, uh, the Africans, the Australians, uh, and the Americans working together in a more holistic way. And I think that's where the opportunity comes from. Thank you. So we need more cross-country uh, and uh, more uh, multilateral uh, leveraging of public-private money. I think you are seeing increasingly uh, the multilateral development banks moving to try to get that kind uh, of leverage. And again, the total amounts of money needed are extraordinary. So the more that that can be leveraged, the better. Um, but speaking of multilateral, John, we've been talking about um, how there's no time to tackle each issue one at a time anymore, but we have set up multilateral environmental agreements, sort of issue by issue, um, but we also have the SDGs. So how can we actually, mm -hmm. how, how can science serve as an integrating force across the multilateral environmental agreements and the SDGs, again, with this image of transformational change happening? Okay, uh, I think you need big demonstration projects uh, for for for, demonst uh, for transformation. So I can also use like uh, Professor Lee a simple equation. I think uh, transformation is um, disruptive innovation plus good governance. Uh, and I happen to advise the European Commission right now on the European Green Deal which is a deep demonstration project worth 1.8 trillion euro. So almost 2 uh, trillion US dollars here. And there, I would like to refer first to what Jane Lubchenko said. She gave this beautiful talk about the narrative uh, of the sea. I think we need to think of a new narrative of modernity. And in particular, this is a discussion that was started in Europe right now. It's about the built environment, you know, whether we are able to convert 
the, the built environment from a source of CO2 into a sink of CO2 by turning our cities into timber built constructions actually. Yeah? And this is a very interesting new way. So there is a movement now called the new European Bauhaus, which is inclusive. It's about beautiful construction. It's about sustainability and so on. So we need a narrative about the transformation of a sector. And then we have to move in all types of innovation ideas into that. Huh? And this is a deep demonstration. Of course, this is referring to many of the SDGs and the multilateral agreements. But if an entire continent sets out actually to transform itself in a green way, if you like, uh, then all these issues come up naturally. So an integrated project, a deep demonstration project at continental scale. And Brian said this, I mean, we can learn from each other actually. Maybe the European Green Deal is a uh, is a role model for uh, American Green Deal or vice versa, actually. Yeah? But we need a narrative and we have to take everybody along. Everybody needs to be, wants to be part of such a narrative. Thank you. We need a narrative about disruptive innovation. We need some uh, demonstrations. And then I think the whole process, as you said, of rapid scale up is a, is a part that not all that many people have really thought through. It seems like that almost requires a different theory of change than happens in the in the demonstration project. And so, you know, we really do want to get to that. Maybe, maybe Marcia, picking up on um, the the convergence, if you will, of the thinking about the blue-green economy. This phrase is really gaining traction as a way to not only interlink ecosystems, both wet and dry, but as a new global priority. So can you, um, following on, on John's thoughts, think of um, some important science across land and sea that might be a great demonstration that could then indeed also be scaled up? Sure, Rosina. So we already heard from Partha very eloquently about if we can't put a price on nature, we aren't going to value it. We'll just uh, use it until we use it up. So I think the first thing that science needs to do is uh, help put a price on nature, uh, biodiversity, uh, open space, marine protected areas, but then also capitalize on all of the demonstration projects that have been done to show what actually works and help put a price on how conservation gets us ahead for multiple generations, for generations to come indefinitely into the future. And I think we all recognize what fruits came out of the information age when suddenly Everything became digital. It could be uh, sent around at the speed of light. Uh, we could uh, share things with multiple people quickly and uh, save it for posterity. There, there would be a new age ushered in through valuing a green-blue economy that could eclipse even the information age in terms of its value to society but we have to first make sure that we measure its worth and then get policies to actually encourage uh, revaluing and preserving that value of nature. And then the private industry is gonna step in and they are going to uh, expand in all sorts of dimensions that will make sustainability the way to be. So I think that's absolutely key, valuation um, and uh, things like national capital accounting, inclusive wealth, et cetera. Um, we are seeing, of course, that uh, the private sector is getting increasingly concerned about their supply chains. And so uh, the valuation of those ecosystem goods and services are very important uh, to monetize and make much more inclusive. Um, and so I think that is a, a great area for advancement although economics has often been called the dismal science, but we don't think so. Um, so 
YT, I wanted to come back to you. You have been trained as all of us were in this kind of, you know, traditional scientific mode of being, um, you know, deep in an area, but not necessarily uh, very broad. However, of course, you have uh, gotten increasingly interested in so many things outside your field. But, you know, we are we are in a different time and, and it was touched on a little earlier, but I wondered what you would suggest about educating the, the next generation of science leaders to think as John has urged us in systems ways to tackle these complex problems that that involve you know understanding uh, across many sectors and understand mm -hmm. valuation and um, understand incentives. Yeah, let me start by saying something philosophical. I think we already said men are part of nature. So humanity and nature has developed together and will survive together. And so we are not going to use nature or conquer nature or destroy nature. This is a philosophical understanding of the relation between humanity and nature. The other thing is we are citizens of global system. And if we face the global problem, we have to have a global solution. So very often, I do believe, although international collaboration has been improving and improving, but we do need to have a global governance. For example, a carbon tax, could we have a global carbon tax rather than every country spend 2% of GDP build up the military to defense themselves against the military from other country. But actually, we are creating our own enemy. The enemy will come not from over the boundary borders. So that is also very important. The other thing is, we, unless we realize that the humanity is overloading the earth at the present time. When we're talking about the development, we talk about the need of the current generation and need of the future generation. We have to understand globally, we are overdeveloped. We are passing the tipping point of many items. And unless we understand those things, our education of the next generation will not be successful. And we are dealing with complex system and education needs to be really has to learn hard sciences, social sciences, and we are we have to find a solution for the complex system. It's going to be very different, but we really need to be a global citizen aside from the citizen of your own country. So this is my level of recognition and transition from your citizenship to global citizen gradually is really very important. I say gradually has to be done in a relatively short time. Thank you. Thank you, YT. I, I mean, one thing that gives me incredible hope is um, the, the way that the students coming up through the university today already kind of think in systems ways that at least to me were quite alien when I came through school. And so I think their ability mm -hmm. To, to marry across the uh, the social and the other sciences um, is is somehow more innate than to us and and of course here we are talking about science needs and we're talking about the need to value the good stuff tax the bad stuff and so we have you know we have wandered in to the need to have a, an economic framework that allows uh, the advances that are needed so urgently. So um, this is now round three, which is a little more uh, free form. I, I want to, you know, we've talked about lots of things at a high level. We've talked about cities a bit. We've talked about agriculture, ecosystems, um, green, blue. Uh, we didn't get much about um, how, to, how to make the models deal with inclusivity more. But why don't I uh, allow you each to, to have just a, a quick turn at 
what key building blocks do you think can be used in the short term to try to get to this kind of a transformational change? And again, you know, you can take the angle of a sector, you can take the angle of a tool, you can talk about um, the pilot projects that you think need be need to be done, but maybe YT will let you go first this time. Are talking to me? Yes, oh. you're, you're on what okay. building block can be used in, in a sector or a tool or whatever that, that you think could very quickly yes. be augmented. I think if they want to have a quick solution, we will encourage people to live better with less. So reduce the consumption because our transformation will not catch up with changing the environment of global warming. So the other alternative is to reduce the consumption. So I would say live better with less. You'll be happier with consuming less. And that's my suggestion. I think that's great. That should be uh, that should be uh, in in bright lights that are LED lights, of course, low energy. Um, uh, Brian, what would you suggest? Well, I mean, I can just following on to YT. Uh, I think you know if you're going to try to get people to live le uh, with less, we're going to have to incentivize it, and so there has to be a pricing of the externalities uh, on nature, as described early. Er, and I think the place that will will make the most rapid progress is probably around electricity. Electrification, both within the developed and the developing world, as Marcia talked about, being able to get very low uh, emission, zero emissions electricity out to the masses uh, should be, to my mind, the highest priority. In the end, most of the technical, technological solutions we're going to look at are going to need energy. And I think that is the place where the sun has provided us uh, a huge energy source, and we should be using it pretty much exclusively. All right. John, yeah. maybe you'll take the bait on my modeling question that it came back <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, I, I promised that I will make a remark on that. But I have two propositions what science could do, actually, in the fairly short term. Huh? One is my current sort of passionate uh, theme is, uh, as I said, the transformation of the built environment, turning the built environment into a sink of carbon, actually. This could be achieved if we build our cities in the future from bio-based material. It can be timber, it can be bamboo, many other things. But we have never done a solid analysis, a solid integrated assessment, whether we can grow enough biomass for doing that. Uh, in a sustainable way without destroying biodiversity and how much can be really converted into constructions. And this is something that needs to be done immediately, more or less, because if we want to really hold the 1.5 degrees line, uh, we need to actually enhance, not only protect, but enhance the carbon sinks on this planet. But the second thing is an outrageous proposition I want to make on modeling, you see, we do not have an Earth system model that deserves the name, really. No center, computing center in the world, no institution does have that. Uh, and in order to really uh, sort of uh, scan the existential risk uh, to the planetary system, we need to move towards an Earth system model. And why not building a community Earth system model, you know, a distributed one? That the finest institutions in the world provide one module, so to speak, and you run it at a planetary scale. This would be a grand challenge. It would be not uh, a race to the moon. It would be a race to planet Earth, actually. And we could use, actually, the most advanced technology and the most advanced methodologies that artificial intelligence machine learning is actually providing us. So a community model, which would be used and uh, driven by artificial intelligence, for example, it sounds uh, very utopian right now, uh, but I think it can be achieved in the next 10 years. So this is my outrageous proposition. 
Well, it's not outrageous given that, you know, in 10 years, we may have committed ourselves to beyond one and a half degrees. Uh, so do you want to answer a short follow up on what you think it would take logistically and economically, or are you not prepared for that? So uh, was this a question for me, Rosina? The, the question, well, my comment was uh, 10 years is about the time at which we will have committed ourselves to 1.5. Do you, do you have a quick comment on what it would take logistically or economically to achieve your bold suggestion in a decade, which is yeah, yeah. maybe okay. not fast enough? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, on the one end, we can start immediately to build something like a planetary community Earth system model. Huh? We have all the constituents in principle, we have to put them together. But my first proposition to look at uh, sort of uh, construction, building, built environment as a carbon sink, that would mean that you could even undo some of the emissions of the past. Huh? If we will probably overshoot the 1.5 degrees line, uh, we will hopefully stop global warming below two degrees. But if we would start to convert our built environment into sort of timber cities, we could actually purify the atmosphere from CO2 again. So we could come back actually to a more sustainable level of atmospheric concentration of CO2. Uh. So that's the big story, the big narrative here. It is resilience, if you like, to planetary scale. Thank you. Although ecological systems don't like the idea of overshooting and coming back. Um, Marcia, but now that, um, what, you know, we've heard a, a lot of activity, um, both domestically and internationally, uh, to really ramp up action on uh, the climate crisis, and we're hoping that 2021 is really the year of biology. What key building blocks do you see that we can build on quickly? So I'm going to throw out something that is really outrageous. I think that scientists need to cooperate with Hollywood on a blockbuster movie that shows a future in which we have not preserved our natural capital and what that looks like. Because imagine the film, or just think of the film Deep Impact. It made everyone afraid of that impacts. And basically that's a lot less likely than the collapse of nature that we see looming before us. And remember the film Contagion, how it was almost a perfect um, prescript for what we are seeing now with COVID-19. I think Hollywood can help people understand what's at stake. And then they start changing their personal values. And then they vote to make sure they've got a government that reflects those personal values. And the government makes policies that encourage the right behavior of industry. And industry completes the circle by giving consumers what they want. So I think we need a blockbuster Hollywood movie. And I'm presuming that everyone on this panel would star in this show? <laughs> possibly not. Possibly not. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Um, but, but, it, but you are coming back to, you know, some of the comments from earlier speakers today uh, about the importance of narrative and of stories. And I know um, way back when we did the first national climate assessment, the only thing required by the Congress on climate to tell the stories of how it's changing the U.S., um, we found that, you know, going to a place and explaining how you're place would be fundamentally different as climate change proceeds was much more powerful than talking about and the temperature will change this much and the precip this much and the summer you know and so um here i am in uh michigan today and if i say summers in michigan are going to feel like arkansas you get ah! <laughs> you don't need to say much more it's a really different sense of place so the importance of narrative and stories i i think um is absolutely important. Uh, we are being warned uh, that we only have four minutes left and there are four of you. So how about 
one minute closing statement on anything you wish from each of you in the original order that I called on you. So that would be John, Marsha, Brian, and YT gets the last word. So John? Okay, I have to start. Okay, I guess we have a golden opportunity for science right now because follow the science is actually something the young people are saying now, you know, Fridays for Future, Greta Thunberg and so on. I mean, they take to the streets and say, follow the science, uh, listen to the science and so on. I think we have a one in a century chance to actually win over the young people for the scientific enterprise. Huh? And we must not, we must not jerk this responsibility. So let's go along with the young, bright people. They will tell us that we are really useful. Okay, so um, I'll just add to that by saying, I don't think science will ever carry the day unless we can actually also address the problem of misinformation. Because misinformation is rampant, it spreads like its own epidemic, except it, ex it spreads through the internet, so that uh, we have the problem where at least um, we can physically distance ourselves from sick people and not get the pandemic, but we can't do that with misinformation. And misinformation is always more exciting, more salient, and more thrilling than the, the correct information. So I think we have to find better ways working with social scientists to address misinformation. Otherwise, this will be for naught. Thank you. Brian? So we've heard uh, today lots of things that we can do. Uh, I agree with all of them. And the reality is we need to do all of them. And we need to do them now. And we need to do them at scale. And so I think it is incumbent on all of us to figure out our part on how we get things to scale up to a global uh, reaction. Uh, and there really is no time to lose. That's the challenge we have. Uh, action at scale now. Thank you. And YT? Well, I want to compare two scenarios. Once I was in Poland, in the capital city, on Sunday, in the park, there's a piano, sit in the middle, somebody playing Chopin, everybody enjoy the music and the sunshine. And another scenario is my car is improving, Tesla self-driving, and Sunday I go to the shopping center uh, driving around. So. I would rather say that they, everybody go to the park, listen to the Chopin, or listen to what you can identify with, rather than improving the technology, but you see driving around, consuming too much. And that was my dream. And if developing country, we have to move. We don't want to move to a society, consume 10 kilowatt. We might move to a society, only use two kilowatt. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to all the panelists for your wit and wisdom. It is true that science is not the loudest voice, but it is a really important voice, and we must all be civic scientists and explain the importance of these issues. So thank you all very much. Caroline, I turn it back over to you. Professor Birbaum, thank you as always. And as I said earlier, Professor Birbaum is a pro, and we are so happy that she will join us again tomorrow, where she will lead a session on governance, inclusiveness, and stewardship. So do not miss that one. During the last year, two scientific workshops were being hosted in preparation for this Nobel Prize Summit. As mentioned earlier, the National Academy of Sciences convened one of them. The other one was convened by the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. These two workshops resulted in a draft of a scientific statement, which is now about to be presented and discussed. The statement has been coordinated by the steering committee for the summit and is here represented by Nobel Prize laureate, Professor Brian Schmidt from the National Academy of Sciences and Professor Johan Rockström, director at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. And I will lead and then hand all over to Johan. So as a Nobel Prize winner, you have an opportunity uh, to amplify the voices of experts uh, in various communities. And as we've heard, we have had two uh, summits uh, in the past year come together and talk about our planet and our future. And so these summits have indicated that we are facing a challenge at an unprecedented scale. And this Nobel Prize Summit is here to uh, give visibility to that so that we can go through and address the issues that come from living in a planet, uh, on a planet that has a scale of which humanity is now affecting on a day by day basis. We note that time is in short supply. The next day, decade is crucial. And if we are going to bend the curves to greenhouse gas emissions and the destruction of nature, we need to act now at scale, as I have just talked about. We risk large scale irreversible changes to the Earth's biosphere. And we need to think our relation with planet Earth. We need to become effective stewards of the global commons. And that means looking through everything from understanding our climate, but also understanding the soils, the rich diversity of life, and how all of these things come together to regulate the planet. It also comes together with the scientific evidence that the greater um, and greater political acknowledgement that human caused climate and ecological crises also cause gross inequality, insecurity, and undermine ultimately the progress in a vicious cycle. So at the heart of our action must come equality for the entire globe. And these summits have brought together a number of things where we need to focus. We need to focus on policy. That is, how do we use the science of economics to go through and underpin the actions that we need to take? Education is paramount. Everyone on the planet needs to understand the notion of science, of consequence, of evidence. And we must make sure, again, that the entire planet and our children and adults alike get that education. We need to understand the emergence of information technology and how it can be used for both good and bad, as Marcia has just talked about. The tools of finance and business can be our friends or our enemies. If we use finance and business to help put in motion the changes that must occur, then we will succeed. Without them, we will fail. Scientific endeavors need to work across the entire globe. We've heard about global uh, projects to understand the Earth system, global projects to go through and to solve the problems that uh, we are discussing today. Knowledge must be shared. There is attempting to go through and to silo knowledge and to keep it protected so that we can continue to do things else. But the world needs every help that we can by sharing knowledge so that everyone can build on everyone else's work without uh, impedance. And finally, we need to have some grand visions. Grand visions where we as a world work with common purpose to go through and rapidly transform how society is impacting the planet. We need governments to go through, put these moonshots, if you want, out there for us to collectively bring together science, business, and the people through governments together with a common purpose. Global sustainability offers the only viable path to human safety, to our equity, to our health, and ultimately to human progress. Uh, if we are going to survive the Anthropocene, that is the epic where humans are impacting the earth and the biosphere, we must absolutely have that global sustainability at the core of all that we do. I'd like now to hand over to Johan Rockström from Potsdam. Yeah, thank, thanks, Brian. Not very much to add there. The only thing I'd like to just inspired by the discussions we've had previously here is is that this statement tries to really communicate that that we're putting science at the service of humanity 
a call from science in terms of the urgency and the need for accelerated movement towards scale, as Brian pointed out, but also as, as Magdalena Skipper emphasized, science as, as a common public good for the service of our future. And we, we see this statement as being a key piece at this super year 2021. So coming as an output from the Nobel Prize Summit to be fed into the United Nations Biodiversity Summit in Kunming in China, the United Nations Food Systems Summit that will follow, and the United Nations Climate COP26 in Glasgow. So we have this, this golden opportunity of, of being here right now at the end of April at a moment where we can put, put this, this scientific synthesis and, and this message to the world from science to work. So, so that is the objective. I just want to re-emphasize again that, that the statement that you have seen is a draft, but it's an effort of synthesizing two scientific workshops. And uh, together with Marsha, uh, I've had the privilege to chair the steering committee where Brian Schmidt has led the statement, but also Yuan Sili is a member of the steering committee, as is Carl Folke, who has been leading the white paper work. So we, we've had a very broad team of academics uh, trying to facilitate this work. And then thanks, Pam, uh, I hope you're still with us, Pam Matson, who together with Bill Clark led the outputs from, from the, the NAS workshop. So it's a collective effort. And what we'd like to offer to you now in the last few minutes is to open the floor for any comments, any questions, any suggestions or advice. And, and just to lay out the, the work plan, we suggest that today is just to present the statement. Um, Holger Hoff, uh, we will put in the chat his email. Uh, one of our core colleagues for the summit will be sharing with you uh, the latest version of a more beautiful layouted version of um, the statement right after this session today. We will come back to it tomorrow uh, when we have the end of the science session tomorrow. And then we hope uh, with your inputs, reflections, or, or who knows, support and, and kind of uh, endorsement, we, we can then invite you as Nobel laureates and as uh, experts, academics, participants to, to sign. And we'd like to have um, signatures in form of, of names aligning with the document, not, not necessarily having uh, physical signatures, but, but that, that you provide your, your, your support if you want to join as individuals. So that's where we are. And with that, um, I think, Brian, we, we opened the floor, but I, I'm just looking at you, Marsha, if, if, if you feel there's anything that Brian and myself have missed, uh, because you've been central to this uh, from the beginning. No, I think your summary was fabulous, Johan, and I want to thank you and Brian for all the hard work on the statement. And I hope everyone will read it, will take it to heart, and will consider uh, whether they want to sign on as an expert or as a Nobel laureate. So thank you very much. Thanks. And, and again, to, to reiterate to the practicalities here, so what, what we are going to do is, is send you the latest layout version. And then uh, you can reply to that email to Holger Hoff. So just by replying email to say, yes, I, I would like to join. And of course, our, our aim is um, to, uh, to, to, to beat you, Brian. I think you got 101 Nobel laureates signing recently the, the pledge for decarbonizing the world's energy system. So we're, of course, aiming for 102 Nobel laureates and, and uh, a broader community of experts a bit jokingly from my side just but but uh, but Brian has a long experience of leading these kind of statements you've been central for the Lindau statements and and I think you you're part of leading this this recent uh, fossil fuel uh, decarbonization statement as well but but floor open I think and any any comments anything in the any questions or or issues here or yeah anything that you'd like to share. And just step in, I can see, 
you can always raise a hand or just just jump in. I, I think we are well over time, Caroline. So my suggestion is almost I think the silence is a sign that we have had a very rich and long, long day. Uh, so I think I'm handing back to, to you, Caroline, and and uh, and that you know we'll come back to this tomorrow, and uh, we'll have uh, you'll have the chance to to go through it a bit more detail now that you've received a, a bit of a verbal verbal summary. Caroline. Thank you, Professor Oxstrom, and thank you, Professor Schmidt. And as said, you will be back tomorrow. Your Royal Highness. Nobel Prize laureates, friends of science, time flies when having fun, and we are now closing this session. I hope to see you all tomorrow, where we will enter our future. Thank you for joining us uh, during this session, and do not forget to visit the website of the Nobel Prize Summit, where you will find the white paper, and the recordings of this session in a couple of days. And a very special thank you to Her Royal Highness, who has been with us here in this spacious, big and beautiful and almost empty Aula Magna at Stockholm University during the whole session. Stay safe, all of you, and see you tomorrow.